Thanks for pressing play. This is Christopher Lockhead, Follow Your Different, where we aspire to have real dialogues, not overproduced interviews, with the amazing people who are making our world a different place. And if this is your first time listening, thanks so much for joining me. And if you're a long-time listener, bless you from the bottom of my heart. As usual, we're sponsored by our friends at Oracle NetSuite. Learn how to turbocharge the growth of your business today at netsuite.com slash different. Hal Elrod is one of the best-selling self-help authors of all time, and I'm glad to call him my friend. He wrote the international sensation, The Miracle Morning. He's an amazing speaker and a top podcaster. On this episode, we unpack his brand new book, which is virtually guaranteed to be a sensation, The Miracle Equation. And there's tons of value in this conversation around how to design a legendary life. So I hope you have a notepad ready. I know you're going to love it. Go to Lockhead.com for more info on Hal and his new book. Now, hey-ho, let's go. I almost had this thought like, oh, shoot, Am I, is it my time to die because I already put the thing on this earth that's going to live long, you know, hundreds of years after I'm gone? And I went, and that almost created like a fear of, uh-oh, you know, God, I'm not, I'm not quite ready. I still have, I still have kids to raise. Like I'm ready, but I'm not. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. No, no, there's more. I'll do Miracle Morning Part 2. Come on. <laughs> I, listen, I'm getting ready to do Miracle Lunch and Miracle Dinner yeah. and Miracle... Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, and that is actually, I mean, you know, interestingly enough, the miracle equation, the new book, I mean, it, it's, it is the formula that I used to beat cancer. And it, 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 it's, it was on my heart. Like if I beat this cancer, I have to share this message with the world. And, you know, I mean, that, that is kind of how that played out. So, so the miracle equation has been something that's been cooking in you for quite some time, right? This is one of those um, ideas that it just having talked to you about it back in December, it felt like it was an idea that's been part of your life for a long time that you, you've been, you've been wanting to unleash. Like it's sort of, or there's this old, um, the lead singer, of the Jay Giles band was this guy named Peter Wolf. And one of my favorite quotes of his in one of their old songs was he said, people sometimes ask me why I scream and I shout, I say, it's in there. It's got to come out. <laughs> and the experience I had of you talking about it, um, uh, at best year ever blueprint was that this was this thing in you that you really it had to come out but but yeah. what's it been like for you writing this book yeah well that, that's the the interesting thing about it anybody that you know is a miracle morning fan or reader or practitioner and follows me or my career you know they, they i think the obvious would be the assumption is oh he did miracle morning and now he's doing kind of like a spin off the miracle equation right you know and what is that about right but but it, it feels like oh he's he's leveraging the brand or whatever right um the miracle equation was 6 years prior to the miracle morning as a concept and is something that i started practicing i started teaching it in my in the company i worked for and so yeah so the, the interesting thing is it preceded the miracle morning right this in fact the miracle equation is how the miracle morning came to be and came to be such a success right so there is an kind of a you know heart court cart before the horse kind of, you know, kind of thing. Uh -huh. But, um, but yeah, when I was 20 years old, I was trying to break a sales record and, uh, it was, I was, I mean, so, you know, to put that in context, I was trying to do something that had not been done in 50 years, uh, that the company that I worked for Cutco had been around, uh, you know, so no one had ever done this before and I, it felt like a miracle. And so I go, man, if I were to break this record, it would feel like a miracle. And then I reverse engineered it and I go, if I were to break it, how, how would that happen? And I, I, I distilled it down to two decisions. I thought I would have to make two decisions that most people don't ever make. Uh, the world's most successful people make them, but most people never make these two decisions. And uh, I would have to maintain those two decisions until I reached my goal, or at least until the last moment that it was possible. And I also realized that most people don't, if they do make the decisions out of like uninformed optimism, they don't maintain them when things get tough, right? And um, the, uh, the two decisions are deceptively simple in their explanation, but they're extremely rare in their execution. But if you study the world's most successful people in any industry, in any walk of life, um, whether they've overcome something extraordinary like, you know, death-defying cancer or whatever, um, or they've achieved something extraordinary, like the world's most prolific creators and innovators, if you study them, th they have all, these are the two decisions that they have made and that they've stood by and lived by until they got to where they wanted to go. And the, you know, if we, if, like, you know, you mentioned self-help earlier, like the, we're the self-help industry, right? 
the self-help industry gives us hundreds of reasons why we're not where we want to be, right? And, I, and, I, and I'm part of that. I mean, I've given, re- there are a lot of reasons you could look at, right? But it's overwhelming because it's like, you know, wait, is it, is, it cause I, is it my lack of productivity? Is it my lack of belief in myself? Is it my habits? Is it my self-confidence? Is it my, my morning routine, right? Like, well, is, is, there's a, which book do I read? There's like hundreds of books that are all telling me that I need to read that one because that's the thing. And, and, and so what's, what's, what's powerful about this miracle equation concept is that you can distill hundreds of problems or answers to why we're not where we want to be into these two decisions. Um, so anyway, I've kind of beat around the bush. If you want, I can, I can go into the what decision. What are the decisions, Hal? <laughs> <laughs> Give me the So the two decisions, decisions <laughs> and these aren't, yeah, these aren't one-time decisions, but it's kind of a fundamental, they're both, it's a fundamental way of living and how you approach your life and every goal you set and every challenge you encounter. The first decision is unwavering faith. And the second decision is extraordinary effort. And like I said, if I just told you that and then we hung up the podcast, you'd be like, well, what the hell do I do? I don't understand. What did it make any sense? And that's uh, where there was Hal a book. Hal Elrod just tell me to believe in myself and work hard, <laughs> yeah. right? And work hard. That's it. Um, but so if, we look at, so if we look at human nature and how that does hold us back, right? So if we, if we could say there's anything that holds us back, it could be it's human nature, right? It's like, well, we're not born with all of the, the natural tendencies that lead us toward extraordinary success, right? So the first, so unwavering faith, there's kind of two parts to it. There's establishing it and then there's maintaining it. So if you think about it, if you look at any world-class individual, whether it's an Olympic gold medal athlete, like you interviewed, you know, Carrie Marshall, right? You just interviewed recently? Carrie Welsh, yeah. Carrie Welsh. I was close. I was close. Um, I got the Carrie part right. And then, uh, but right, whether you, you look at an Olympic athlete or, you know, world champion um, or, uh, or you look at a multimillionaire, they all started by, me, the, by establishing the faith that they could do something that they had never done before right? That if they looked in their past, there was no proof. There was no evidence that they could do this thing. And for most people, that's right where they stop. They go, dude, I, uh, who am I, who, I, I, who am I to be uh, great, right? Who am I to be? I, I've done nothing. I'm just a normal person, right? Yep. So establishing the faith that you can do something you've never done before is counterintuitive to our human nature, but it's required, right? And that's the first element of you've got to establish the faith you can do something and put it in writing. I mean, it's real simple. It's, I'm committed to blank. I can achieve blank. You know, no matter what, there's no other option. Like you've got to put that faith in writing and condition it every single day. And the second part of the faith is making sure it's unwavering by sustaining it. Because there's a lot of people. Like if you if you're in the self help industry or you know you're you, you're a practitioner, you probably believe in the optimist credo that anything is possible. Right? Anything is possible. But, but possible is not enough to get us up in the morning, right? Like if anything, if just the things that were possible were motivators, we'd, we'd all be rich and famous and successful and right. Um, we've got to take it from possible to probable, right? That's the first kind of evolution on the journey to inevitable, which is where miracles happen. But first it's possible to probable. The way you start to close that gap and bridge that gap is by putting in writing, right? The faith of what you're, you know, stepping out on faith that you can do this thing you've never done before. And then you reinforce it through, I call it the miracle mantra, right? Which is I'm committed to achieving blank, whatever your goal is, no matter what, there's no other option. And so whenever we're faced with fear and self-doubt, you know, cause we encounter obstacles or adversity or setbacks, um, normally the voice of self-doubt and the voice of fear is what overrides us. And we go, oh, uh, I, I'm not on track. It doesn't look good. Who am I kidding? I, I, what, what's the, why am I even trying? And Imposter we've got to syndrome, o- right? Start screaming in our heads. I can't do this. Uh, Com- completely. And, and so we've got to replace the fear with faith. And, and I want to, Chris, I'm going to share a really important distinction on this. Um, this may be one of the most important distinctions when it comes to this unwavering faith component. You don't actually have to believe you can achieve the goal in order to keep moving forward and ensure that you achieve the goal. And this goes back to, and this is really important because a lot of people hear advice and they go, maintain faith, but I don't have. I hate to interrupt you. Did you say I don't have to believe I can do it? Nope. You don't have to believe you can do it. So if I have some outrageous goal, I want to be the prime minister of Canada, which I don't want to be, but (laughs) an outrageous goal. I don't, even though I've set that as a goal for myself, I'm trying to work towards that goal. If I don't really believe that I can do it, that's okay. Because 
here's, 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 let me, let me, you know, this is really fine language and I'm still getting used to explaining this. So let's, we'll get to this, but it might, yeah. it might take me a few tries. So, um, you, you don't have to believe that you're going to do it. You have to believe it's possible for sure. Right. And you have to believe that if you keep moving toward it, it's, an, you know, it can become inevitable. But, but let me, let me, let me bring it down to a real life example, which is the very first, the sales period. I'm going to go back to the original story of how this came to be. I was trying to do something that had never been done before. And I was trying to do it in a time period that was 30% shorter than I originally was told that I had, which made it feel next to impossible. Right. Now, if you would have bet me money, you know, cause I, cause I was, I, I decided part of the unwavering faith is I am not allowed to speak any words out of my mouth other than I'm going to reach the goal. Even though I don't believe it, I'm not allowed to say that I don't believe it. Okay. So if you would have come to me and you would have said, how dude, you're trying to do something that's that, that this is like, there's the chances of you hitting this goal or are, are slim to none, dude, I'll bet you a thousand dollars that you will not reach this goal. I would, have I would have been like, dude, I'll bet you $1,000 I'm not going to reach the goal. I mean, I wouldn't have taken the bet. But the point is, I didn't really believe it because the odds were so slim. But here's an important distinction. And this actually, I learned this from my mentor, Dan Cassetta, who you know Dan now, right? He spoke at our event. I do. Um, and he's actually been on my podcast and he came oh. and we hung out at the beach and had burritos. And, dude, so and you know Dan intimately. Knives afterwards. Dan Cassetta, like he's one of these dudes where you're like, you know, he runs a sales organization that swells up to about 5,000 people, if I remember right. Which, yeah. You know, it was a pretty fucking large sales organization last time I checked. Yeah. And he's like such a sweet, like, uh, it doesn't even seem real that he could be so fucking nice. Like, he's just <laughs> so thoughtful and nice. I'm not thoughtful or nice. And he's so thoughtful or nice. It's incredible. But I, I digress. <laughs> He's actually not that thoughtful or nice. I think it's just the contrast between you and him that you feel he's not kidding. <laughs> exactly. That must be it because I am not thoughtful and I'm very, well, I'm, I try to be nice, but not so, it's not natural. Yeah, yeah no, I'm, I'm half that. I'm, I'm very nice, not thoughtful at all. Um, I'm thoughtless actually. But um, anyway, what, what the hell are we talking about? Miracle equation? <laughs> We're talking about your, you had this incredible sales goal. And oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I didn't believe it, right? It. So yeah, so if you would have you know, been like, I'll bet you $1,000, you're not going to do it. I mean, I really didn't think I was going to do it. But here's the lesson. And I learned this from Dan Cassetta. And this was, I believe, handed down from Jim Rohn. And I'll paraphrase it. But it's that the purpose of the real purpose of a goal, as in the highest benefit that you can get from setting and pursuing a goal, is not to hit the goal. It is who you become on the journey toward the goal by giving it everything you have, no matter what right? And so I remembered that. And that's where I decided to commit to the goals. I thought, you know what, I'm going to commit to put all of my life force into working towards this goal, knowing that I may not hit it. However, since the highest purpose of a goal is not to hit the goal, but it's developing the qualities and the characteristics of the type of person that can hit bigger and bigger goals each and every time you venture out toward achieving one, I'm, I'm going to buy into that. So I'm going to give it everything I have. I'm going to maintain unwavering faith. I'm going to put forth extraordinary effort until the last possible moment, regardless of my results along the way. Even if I'm nowhere near the goal, I will be giving it everything I have until I, I drive to the sales conference and walk up on the stage to, you know, collect my, you know, or, or, or you know, be in the contest. And so, so that's the point of, you know, me not, I didn't really believe it was going to happen, but that didn't change that I was going to give it everything I had until the last moment. And, and here's the thing, when you, this, this unwavering faith mindset, it's not a one-time decision. It's a fundamental way of approaching your life, every challenge you encounter, every goal that you set. That's what unwavering faith is about. It's, um, and let's go to athletes. Michael Jordan, I just, I used him as the example in the book, right? Michael Jordan growing up, he was the, the epitome of the world's greatest, you know, champion in my mind, the world's greatest athletes will use the Michael Jordan as the example at some point in his life. And it may have been because of a mentor instilled this in him, maybe he made his own decision, but he, he made a decision whether consciously or unconsciously that he would maintain unwavering faith that he can make every shot that he took 
That's why when the game is on the line and 90% of players are like, dude, I don't want the ball. We're down by two. Like, I'm not, we only got a chance for one shot. I might miss. They don't have faith that they can make that final shot. But even if Michael missed the last six shots in a row, which would cause most players' faith to waver, in that final huddle, Jordan says, I want the ball. Give me the ball. I'm going to make this shot. Even if he missed the last six shots and the last three game winners, he wants the ball every single time. It's a fundamental way of thinking that separates you from 99% of the world in any challenge you encounter and any goal that you approach. You know, it's so interesting that you say that because in my conversation with Kerry Walsh uh, Jennings, we, we talked about exactly this topic. And, you know, for her, she the way she said it is her love of winning is greater than her uh hate of law of losing hmm. and she just always wanted to be that person and her her father instilled that in her and she is just absolutely you know she's the winningest volleyball player in history and one of the greatest uh, olympic champions in history this is a woman who won a gold medal while she was fucking pregnant <laughs> I mean, this is a very serious competitor. Wow. Um, and, 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 you know, that is a very interesting mindset. And the other thing she said that ties exactly to what you're talking about, I asked her about her physicality in her body and what, it, what it's like to have your body be your instrument and all the training and all, this, all that sort of line of discussion. Uh, and she said, Anne, all of my competitors do all of that too. And the thing that separates the champions is the mental game. Is mm. their mental health? Is their mindset? She said exactly what you just said. She must. She she must have got an advanced copy of the book. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> well, you must like her better than me because I don't know where my advanced copy is. But we don't, don't have. Well, I don't have them yet, man. Do you see? My, I, I'd be holding it up on this video right now if uh, if I had one, man. As long as you okay. promise to sign it for me. <laughs> you got it. You got it. Signatures are hundred bucks a pop. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. I could probably handle it. <laughs> <laughs> and so the thing is, um, the thing I love about your work is you say things that are eye opening. And to your point, I think right off the top, Hal, um, the difference is in the execution. And there's something about you, as opposed to a lot of other, if I could call them self help gurus. Mm -hmm. where, and maybe it's because you're not one of these idiot carnival barkers. Um, <laughs> you actually are relatable in a way that goes, that makes people go in my mind, in, in their mind, certainly in my mind, hey, Hal Elrod says I can actually execute this idea. And so, and maybe there's a hard question to answer, but what is it about you that inspires people to actually fucking do stuff as opposed to, the vast majority of, you know, uh, wannabe self-help gurus who, um, yeah, you hear their speech or maybe you read their book or whatever and you go, that's an interesting idea. And then for the most part, we go back to a normal life. So w maybe I'll ask it this way in the context of people who read your books. Like, what is it about your books and your talks and your podcast and all of it that you think has people take the, the step that matters, which is, and now I'm going to do this in my life? Yeah, I think part of it can go back to what we talked about earlier about, you know, transcending ego, which is that I, I'm never trying to impress people, you know, and uh, probably 10 years ago or maybe more, I, I came up with a philosophy, which is, and it's a lesson for anybody, which is give up being perfect for being authentic. And I think that, you know, we all have this image that even as kids, like we want to appear perfect to our peers. And, uh, and for me, I realized, and actually Robin Sharma, you know, can get, get some credit here for this is Robin says that when you're vulnerable, people fall in love with you, right? Which means there's when you're yourself, when you're not trying to impress. And I think that for me, I've, I've never had a problem uh, just, you know, uh, well, then there's two, there's two things. The first part is what we're talking about, which is um, just like, I, I, I would rather tell you about what's wrong with me, right? Than, than how great I am. You know, and, and for me, I think that that's probably if people relate, that's why it is. They're like, because they're, they watch these other guys, you know, like if I see even like Tony Robbins, too, I love Tony, but I'm, I'm like, I'm intimidated because he's, he come, he's like perfect. He comes across perfect to me, you know, right? And I know he's not, but I mean, he comes across as just so polished and perfect. And Brendan Burchard, I love Brendan. I admire Brendan. I learn from Brendan, but I, I feel like I can never be Brendan. I feel like I can never be Tony, you know, and it may, maybe because I'm the everyman. 
Right. Yeah. I'm the everyman self-help guy. You know, I'm like, right. Hal, I just, I come across as just, this is who I am and I make mistakes and I got all these insecurities and these fears and these flaws, but I keep going anyway. I keep, you know, I keep moving anyway. Right. I don't believe I can do it. Like I didn't know miracle morning. I had no idea it was going to be a success at all. I just, but I just believed in it and I just kept going. I think the second answer may be more specific to why, why, why do the, why is the miracle morning, for example, and hopefully the miracle equation that, you know, coming, coming out today, uh, why, why are those books making such an impact for people? And I can go back to when I was in Cutco, I got really good at getting referrals. Like our company average was like three to five referrals per appointment. And I figured out how to get 15 to 20. And part of it goes along with just probably being authentic and this and that. But the point is I then got really, I was able to teach it at our, at our sales meetings and, you know, at the end of the day, my manager would call and go, Hal, man, I don't know what you're doing, but every, almost every person on our team just got 15 to 20 referrals today, right? So I think that I've got this ability, maybe because I'm not, I don't, I don't know what it is. I'm not that smart or I'm too smart to where I'm able to just really simplify like, hey, let me hold your hand. Here's how you take, here's how you go from where you are to where you want to be in this like, like baby steps. I'm not going to talk at a high level to you. I'm not going to talk, you know, at 30,000 foot view and you got to figure it out. No, no, no. I'm going to say, do this. And then, and then in three minutes, do this <laughs> and then write this thing down. And then, like, I just really simplify it and give people a really exact roadmap on here's how you go from where you are to where you want to be. So I don't know if that answers your question, but I, I, I there's some self-reflection. <laughs> yeah, no, I think it does. Uh- so if I go to point number one, this unwavering faith, yeah, um, there's sort of two components in my head that I go to, which is number one, how do I have unwavering faith in the face of no results, whether it's no results in this domain in my past, or the, kind of what you said earlier, which is there's no evidence I can do this. That's yeah. one version of no results that can be hard for many people, myself included, to overcome. And the other one that, that I think may be even a little harder, if you have the, if you summon the courage to go for something that you care about, how do you keep going in the face of uh, no results or, or results that you don't think are anywhere near what they should be? And you're like, fuck, I'm banging my head. You know, I want to be yeah. the next Bruce Springsteen or whatever the thing is, right? And it's like, well, I'm, I'm playing... I'm playing open open mics here at the down and out coffee shop with, you know, three people and a dog. And like, how do you keep going in the face of very little results, either historical or in the present? Yeah. Yeah. So in, uh, in the book, I talk about there's different places you can, you can summon your faith from. Right. So, so, so some folks summon their faith from God, right. And they, and they, you know, from a higher power, from a spiritual source. And that's where some people that they'll pull their faith from. Um, uh, and then, uh, some, you, you can look in your past, but like you said, if you don't have anything in the past, um, I'm a big, I'm a big believer in borrowing faith from other people. Right. So, uh, if you, if another human being, I think this is one of the most important beliefs for us to hold true. If another human being on planet earth has accomplished a result that is similar to what I want to accomplish, that is evidence that it is possible for me. I feel like that's one of the most important beliefs. And again, it's not human nature, where human nature is, we, 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 we tend to find differences in separation. Well, of course they did. They're smarter than me. They're better looking than me. They have more experience. They weren't abused as a child. They had two parents. I only had one. They, right? We create all this separation. But I think that we've got to switch, flip that and go, no, 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 no. They're a human being that was born with unlimited potential, just like me, whether or not they've had the same hardships or that I have. And that's the thing is we can, we can find, you know, there are countless people that have had, uh, for most of us that have had it worse than us. It's almost, there's almost anybody on the planet that could find someone that had it worse than them and still overcame that and achieved amazing results, right? So that's one is borrowing faith from other people. I think that's a really big one. Um, you know, for me, when I started in sales, um, for me, it was a mentor, uh, Jesse Levine, who hired me. And uh, he believed that I could break the, you know, our, one of our company records when I was new. And I was like, dude, he doesn't know that I'm this insecure, goofy, you know, like, I don't know what he's thinking. But I just kind of was like, well, if, if he thinks I can, maybe I can, right? So sometimes you borrow it from somebody else in your life that's a mentor. But again, if you're if universally for anybody, you, you can borrow it, like for every author that I read, for example, to me, that's a mentor, 
right? Uh, they're not talking face to face. They don't know that I'm reading their book, yep. but I'm learning from them. Yep. And that's often I'm point. learning more from them than if I were talking face to face because, I mean, you've written a book, right? That, that's, that's all of your knowledge distilled and edited and perfected and organized, right? I mean, you're going to get to me, there's way more value in mentorship sometimes from a, a book than actually talking to the person. You know, you think, well, if I got an hour with Christopher yeah. Lockhead, I'd, he'd tell me how to change my life. Well, no, 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 read his book. You, that you're going to get way more. You know, You've heard Christopher Lockett, half of the words of the hour are going to be the F word and you're not going to even understand what he's talking about half the time. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so exactly. just buy, play bigger or buy niche down and there's your mentorship. So no, it's funny that you say that because I get that. I got one this morning, a gal I worked with years ago, wonderful gal sends me a note, says uh, how much she loves my shit. Very sweet of her. And then she says, and by the way, you know, our company just hired this new CMO and he's a big fan, blah, blah, yada, yada. And he would love to talk to you. And I, I haven't found a nice way to say exactly what you're saying, but th the truth is he doesn't want to talk to me. Yeah. If he, if he wants to learn that shit that you say he wants to learn, what there is for him to do, and I know this sounds horribly self-serving and <laughs> shitty but yeah the right answer is read my books and listen to my podcast and you're going to get way more and you're going to be yeah. able to hone in on the things that matter to you sitting down for a beer with me is going to be nowhere like not in, like infinitely less valuable than actually consuming the shit but i don't know how you tell people that without sounding like an asshole <laughs> Just PayPal them 20 bucks and be like, look, it's not even about them. You know, here, buy my book with this money I'm giving you. Actually, that's an interesting idea. If I only I knew how to use PayPal, <laughs> that's a great idea. The podcast is free, so maybe that one's easy. But yeah, maybe yeah. I'll pay, figure out how to send people 20 bucks to buy the book. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, what is funny, I actually, we have a template, my, you know, my assistant, when people email questions on like, oh, can Hal give me advice on this topic? Um, I mean, very often it's stuff that I don't know anything, you know, and I just, I, I go, look, it, I would just have to Google search what they're asking for. <laughs> so I just always, my assistant like does a Google search and sends it to him go, look, we found 60,000 articles on the thing that you need help with. <laughs> Give a man a None fish, they eat for a day. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. So should we talk about the second decision? Yeah, let's talk about it. We, 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 so unwavering faith. Yep. And like and I we, said, these are and simple we, and and explanations. We faith from wherever, whatever sources we can draw that faith from, whether it's the Lord up above or a friend or a mentor or... Or, or just the internal faith that, you know what, if I keep moving in the direction of a goal or a dream, I'll eventually get there. And if I don't get there, I'll probably find a, you know, I'll, 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 I'll find a fork in the road along the way and end up somebody even somewhere even better. Yeah. So there is a general faith in, in the, in the, you know, the, the idea that if you move confidently, you know, what is the quote from Henry uh, David Thoreau? If you move confidently in the direction of your dreams, you'll meet with success unexpected in common hours, yada, 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 yada. I don't know the rest of the quote. Well, and but, I um, always thought that success <laughs> is about failing in the right direction. There you go. And to your point, it, the success you achieve might not necessarily have been the success that you thought you were going to achieve. Um, but it's going to show up somewhere. Often yeah. it is what you thought you'd achieve, but sometimes it's not. It's some unexpected fork in the road to your point. Yeah. Um, but here's what we do know. Sitting on the couch, drinking beer and farting is probably not going to get you there. That's right. Yeah. And you think about it, that's what people do is like, because most people want a guarantee of success. Like, well, what I could, I could spend all this time and then it not work out. Right. It, it, but it's like, if you look back at the real purpose of a goal that I talked about earlier, it's to, it's, it's not to achieve the goal because often the goal moves, right? It shifts. It's replaced by a different goal. It's who are you becoming on your journey through this life and who you become is what opens new opportunities and doors and, you know, and, 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 and so on and so forth and creates new connections and resources and so on. I never intended to be an author. I had no desire to write a book. I was planning on being the greatest Cutco manager in the history of Cutco. That was my path. And then I got in a car accident and then I went, well, maybe I'm supposed to do something different. Maybe I'm supposed to help people with this journey that I'm on and share it. And, you know, and, and then wrote a book and never intend, I mean, it all just, but yeah. I kept, but the, here's the thing, be the best at what you're doing, right? Move in the direction of being the best and giving everything you have to what you're doing. And that's why I say the miracle equation isn't a 
one-time decision to achieve a one-time goal. It's a fundamental way of living. Unwavering faith is the fundamental lens through which you approach all of your life's challenges and all of your opportunities and, and goals and dreams. And if you approach everything with that, then you are the type of person that will create a life more extraordinary than you can imagine, even if it might be different than you imagine now. The life I'm living now, Chris, the, you know, I'm going to Brazil this month to go speak to you know, my book. I don't know if you saw it. It's crazy. The Miracle Morning is the number one book in all of Brazil of every book in every category in, in the country. Yeah. I didn't, I mean, right? Well, see, I, I always thought Brazil was great. More evidence yeah. of that. That, but Have that wasn't my before? plan. You know, I didn't set out to do that. There was never a goal. I didn't set out to do any of that, you know? Have you been so, there before yet, Hal? Uh, no, I have not. This is my first time going to, uh, oh to my Brazil. God. My dad's going with me, too. It's going to be, gonna be cool. Um, well, father, where, son, are you going? Where are you going? Uh, Sao pa Paulo. Sao yep. Paulo. Sao Paulo. One day, yeah. one day I'm speaking at an event, and then one day I'm with my publisher doing publicity, and I don't know what city that's in, but uh, somewhere down the road. Maybe Rio. I don't know. There's a lot of big cities in, in, in Brazil, but you will have a great time. The people could not be more friendly, uh, fun, the food, the culture, the nightlife. Um, I, I, I've been there a handful of times um, nice. and uh, always on business. And um, they're great to do business with. I, I have had a wonderful time in Brazil in my life. And I, I'm not surprised they love you there. Yeah, it was actually this uh, Adriana Santana. She is a reality TV star with millions of Instagram followers. She read The Miracle Morning, started practicing it, and then she started posting it. And that's how it literally, she's the, she was the catalyst for it reaching millions of people in Brazil. Totally crazy. Are you totally get wild. to meet her while you're there? I'm, I'm speaking at her event. This is her first ever live event. She, she was making uh, all of her money off of promoting beauty products and had this huge Instagram following. And then she realized like she just was compelled in her heart. I want to inspire people. I want to help people, not just sell them makeup, you know? And so she started shifting and using her and, and the Miracle Morning was like the first book she read on her personal development journey. And so now she's putting on her first live event and she's doing all sorts of inspirational stuff. And um, yeah, you should look her up on Instagram What's um, your name again? Adriana Santana. And um, you will enjoy her Instagram photos. That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. She sounds like a wonderful gal. <laughs> yeah, I sent her a picture. I said, I, I, I screenshotted her picture. I said, hey, dad, you want to go to Brazil to speak with me for this? Or with, with me? I'm speaking for this client. He's like, tell me when the flights are. I'm, I'm there. <laughs> <laughs> that's uh, fantastic all the more reason to have a good time in brazil well say hi to adriana for me <laughs> yeah brother i will man i will <laughs> okay so number two extraordinary Get, effort ex extraordinary uh, effort yeah you know and again at first at first blush it, it's like you know yeah faith and effort great right um and then that and, and by the way I'll, I'll pause and i'll say that Th this is it's kind of this is why i wrote the book right because you know, the, these really are, it's a little more complicated than the miracle morning in terms of, it, it's interesting that it's so simple. The miracle equation is so simple that it takes more of an explanation and more examples and a deeper understanding and a daily practice to really ingrain it so that your fundamental way of living is unwavering faith and extraordinary effort. Um, and so the extraordinary effort piece is I mean, yeah, you could say, right, you know, believe and work hard, you know, but the way that I just, I break down extraordinary effort in the book is I go, look, you want to make it ordinary because just the, the term extraordinary effort is like, I don't want to, I don't want to do that. That sounds hard. Extraordinary effort. That sounds like a lot of work. Where, what's the shortcut to success? What's the easy way? But the way that I break down extraordinary effort is it's, it's really defining what is your recurring process that will move your success from possible to probable to inevitable. So when I was, when I was in sales, I could break down, I, I knew what my averages were, right? If I do 10 appointments, I'm going to sell on seven of them. I'm going to sell an average of, you know, $400 per appointment for $2,800 of sales. So therefore, if I do a hundred appointments, I'm going to sell on 70 of them for an average of 20, you know, right? I, I could break down the numbers. And so I then went further back and I go, okay, how many phone calls do, does it take me to make to schedule one appointment? Okay. And then what happened is I could literally look at my entire goal for the year and I could go, okay, how many calls do I have to make every day? How many days a week to virtually guarantee that I will, I will achieve this level of sales and income, right? So, so, that, so my recurring process, and I call this the power of the process, right? Which is you simply go, okay, 
what is the process? And if you look at any goal, any result, any call it a miracle that we want to achieve or create in our life, it's always preceded by a process. If your miracle is losing 20 pounds, right? Or 50 pounds or whatever. Well, that's preceded by a process of exercise and diet. You're not calling me fat, are you, Hal? No, you, you have no need for that to be your miracle, Christopher. Um, for your miracle is to be nicer and more thoughtful based on what you said earlier. <laughs> um, so, so your process is probably writing wanna, bank cards. Know, just to have a diversion, here's how unthoughtful I am. <laughs> yeah. And here's what a legendary woman I'm married to. So my wife knows I'm not thoughtful. Yeah. So for Valentine's Day, she orders herself the flowers that she wants. And because she's smart and practical, she's like, we don't need to do anything on the 14th. But we are going to go and get a couple's massage at Chateau de la Ding Dong in Carmel on the 15th. So she organizes the flowers she wants and the present slash experience she wants. And she executes it. And I participate. That's, that's what happens in my life now. <laughs> Chris, can I, can I tell you that I think your wife needs to meet my wife because uh, this last Valentine's Day, my wife went and picked up her flowers at Costco. Now, her birthday happens to be the day after Valentine's Day. So she ordered two gifts for herself from Swarovski Crystals that she put in my office so that I could have our nanny wrap. Uh, <laughs> And uh, no, I mean, literally, and she's so practical that we never go out on Valentine's Day. No, dude, I, you just spoke to my heart, to my life. That is amazing. We are and, equally you know, unthought to this thing. You know, you know, we talk about miracle morning for couples for a sec, but know who you're married to. Yeah. yeah. My wife is not pissed that she schedules her own Valentine shit. This is yeah. the shit she wants. And she yeah. wants to do some shit with me and we do yeah. it and we have a great old time. Yeah. And, and I, and yeah, and I think it's important, you know, to know that that's it, man. Know who you're married to and, and, and know what's important to them. So I, I do know that there are certain things that my wife, you know, she does, she would like to show that I do actually take time out of my schedule to think about her and to, you know, and while those are, you know, my, the bar is low, yeah. <laughs> the bar is very low. I get a couple things, right? Like I would probably say, Three out of four times her car needs filling with gas, I do it. So, you know, yeah. it's not like I try to do stuff along the way. But in terms of that, like, thoughtful, romantic-y stuff, I don't have yeah. any – I don't have a romantic bone in my body. I can't – I don't yeah. know why. I just don't. And so, you know, I might remember, oh, shit, it's Valentine's Day and stop at Safeway. Or, you know, maybe maybe I could do a little better than that. But, like, she knows she if, if she doesn't order the flowers she wants, she's going to get whatever I can come up with when I figure out that the day that today is Valentine's Day. <laughs> yeah, which is you're going to go to Walmart at 6 in the morning, totally. which I've done that before. <laughs> totally. uh, that's funny. Um, but, uh, but, yeah. Okay, so back at the extraordinary effort. Um yeah, so it's clarifying your recurring process that will move your, your goal from possible to probable to inevitable. And, and what does that process look like for you, right? What is, again, if you're, that's what makes, if you think about the world's most successful achievers, right? They, most of them, what made their effort extraordinary was consistency, right? I know you're a big anti-hustle and grind and, you know, and so am I. It's like, no, don't dedicate your whole life to work and that's all you do all day long. You work 80 hours a week and neglect everything else, so your health, your family, on and on. Um, and I've been guilty of that, you know, when I was younger, for I sure. I too, big time. Yeah. That's why but, I um, know. And actually, uh, another little bit of a side note, a buddy of mine who's an entrepreneur, a real estate developer, made an interesting comment in this regard. And, and what he said was, there's a distinction between hustle and grind and grit. Hmm. He said, what you admire is grit. And there's hard work in grit. Nothing legendary comes without some level of hard work. Sure. But we can work smart. We have to tough shit out. But if we kill ourselves doing it, then we're fucking dead. Right? The, <laughs> point, the point is having a legendary life. Yeah. Right. Having a three, what, what I like to think of as a 360 degree life. And look, yeah. there are moments in time where we're in balance and we work super hard and we do work 80 hour weeks because that's what is required. And, and, and I think that's an important thing to talk about. But this hustle, hustle, hustle bullshit just says, well, you know, work 120 hours a week and ta-da, you'll be successful. And it's insanity. Yeah. 
Yep. No, yeah, I, I agree. And, and, and I like right now, as an example, I am in a period of intentional imbalance and my family and I are all, we've had conversations, the kids understand, right? Like, you know, daddy's got this giant book launch that he's doing and, um, you know, and so I'm, I'm flying all over the place. I'm doing a lot, you know, but it's like the beauty of it is that, that, that is not my anchor, right? My anchor is family first. And, and so the, I get to come back that I'll always come back to that. And, and before I had cancer, it wasn't, it was like, no, 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 uh, I'm going to get in. I'm going to check the box with, I, I spent some time with the kids today, but I've got to work. Like I got to work, I got to work. Right. And that was my anchor. And so I'm so grateful. That was probably the biggest gift of cancer that my family benefits from, you know, and that I benefit from is, uh, is that, 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 that what really matters health and family, right. Health and relationships. That's the anchor. Everything else revolves around that. But, but, but again, for a few months, no, it's, I'm, I'm working a little more than I normally would, but, but, but it always comes back to yeah, family. Look, nobody legendary produces legendary results by um, putting out a non-legendary effort. Yeah. And it's going to take massive imbalances. If I want to be uh, Carrie Walsh, I'm going to have to play a whole shit ton of volleyball. And I'm going to sure. have to train my body and I'm going to have to train my mind and I'm going to have to think about my diet. And I'm, I'm going to have to do things that most people are unwilling to do. And it means that she'll be out of balance a bunch yeah. right now. It doesn't yeah. mean when you look at your life uh, in total that we need to be out of balance. But at times, if we that's why, I mean, you're calling it extraordinary effort. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's not ordinary. <laughs> And so there's an interesting thing here. I, I got a question for you about this. I would assert, and this is a little bit of thinking out loud, so, you know, bear with me, but yeah. I would assert that um, the vast majority of human beings that most human beings admire, admire them in part and probably in a large part because they achieved something that required extraordinary effort. You know, we admire mm -hmm. somebody who wins a Nobel Prize or, uh, you know, Craig Vettner for mapping the human genome or, you know, I admire so many entrepreneurs. I you, Look, I, anybody who says anything negative can go fuck themselves. Elon Musk is incredible. Yeah. Um, and, 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 and so many authors and so, you know, I, I admire, you know, Bill Walsh so, so, I mean, he's such an incredible, and I've gotten, been lucky enough to, you know, and on and on and on, right? So yeah. you say, well, why do we admire all these people that we admire? In large part, we admire them because they achieved something that required extraordinary effort that most people aren't willing to to go for that's yeah. why we fucking admire them and so there's this weird dichotomy which is if that's the thing that we sort of respect the most in other human beings or certainly one of them maybe let me say it that way then yet why are so many people a sucker for all this get rich get awesome quick quick trick bullshit when we know there's no such thing yeah, I think it's because human nature is to take the path of least resistance, you know, and um, I, I address that a lot in the miracle equation of how like you, in order to achieve what you want, you have to live counter to your human nature. Human nature is to take the easy road. It is to seek comfort over challenge, right? I mean, on and on and on. And so you really have to understand, like one of the things I talk about in the book is there's a, a chapter where we go into like, what, what are the, I call it the inherent human conflict, right? We have all these internal conflicts. One of the, the inherent human conflict, the main, like the big picture one is, um, I know that I have the potential to be great, but I'm settling for so much less, right? And it's that inner, that inner voice that's like talking, oh, man, there's this separation between what I want and who I know I could be and the way that I'm living my life, you know? And so, and then, and then we break down the conflict of go, okay, well, what are the components that are causing you to accept less than you really want, accept less than your best, live below your potential, you know, and so you have to really understand that and break it down and go, okay, oh, well, that's what's holding you back. Oh, that's why I'm being lazy. Oh, that's why I've got these bad habits. Oh, that's why my thinking is limited. Oh, that, you know, and, and so understanding this inherent human conflict and then figuring out how can I overcome the conflict so that it, you know, it, it's, it's not stopping me anymore. It might still be there. I still have the conflict. I still have the conflict between, you know, realizing that, um, I, I mean, I always feel like there's more that I could give more that I could do, you know? Um, but it's having, you know, that letting that conflict go from 
stopping you to, yeah, the conflict's back here, right? Now it's back here. I've moved past the conflict and, and sometimes I get sucked into it, but I keep moving. I, you know, I'm outrunning the conflict, so to speak. Oh, you're, I lost, I lost your audio. Oh, I thought I was, uh, sorry, oh. I was on mute. Now you're back. Th that's so fascinating. Why is it, you made this statement there that really st st struck me. Why is it that we accept less, particularly in areas where we feel like we have more potential, more, more possibility? Why do we fucking sell ourselves out? I think it's human nature. It's because it's so strong, right? You think about it being successful, you know, and that's like with the whole extraordinary effort part, like I, I talked about in the book, like let's make it unextraordinary. Let's make it as simple as possible for you, right? So that you can actually, you know, get to work and make progress without feeling overwhelmed by this bear that you've got to, you know, eat, you know, that you got to tackle. Um, but it's that it's always easier to do nothing. And I think that's the simplest answer. I could literally say that that's it. Why do we settle for less? Because it's easier to do nothing. It's always easier to do nothing and human nature is to do what's easiest. That's just, that's human nature. And do you think, you know, for years in self-help and personal growth, we heard a reason people don't get off the dime and do it is because they fear going for it and failing. And so they would rather not go for it and protect themselves from uh, failing at something they really cared about. Do you think this is actually the more powerful sort of more primordial motivator, which is, you know, at a very primordial level, you could argue and listen, you know, school was over for me in high school, but uh, so what do I know? But um, that human beings are drawn to, if we're in a situation where we can be comfortable, you know, let's be comfortable because we never know when there's going to be a famine or there's going to be a war or we're going to, you know, whatever it is, right? Like, we, you know, we're, we're not that evolved past being sort of tribal uh, creatures and, and, and uh, you know, let's call a, a spade a spade animals. And so, sure. you know, if you look at an animal, you put down food, you know, do that dog is going to eat food until it pukes because it, it instinctively doesn't know when it's going to eat again, eat, right? And so is it that this is this sort of primordial, if I'm in a situation where I can be comfortable and I can rest and recover, I do because of that primordial need or where do you think it comes from? So um, the, it, it, there's something I call the irrational fear of opportunities and the it, it is, I think, so to your point, I don't know that, I don't know which one is stronger, meaning, right, is it because we, 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 we move toward the path of least resistance and we, it's always easier to do what's easy than it is to do what takes effort? That's one component, one of the inherent human conflicts. Another inherent human conflict is this irrational fear of opportunities. And again, it is prehistoric in our brain that, that we were you know, wired to avoid danger right? And if you think about it, avoiding danger, which right back in our caveman days, it was, you know, it was real danger because, you know, a lion could eat us or a mountain lion or whatever. And now we don't actually, for most of us don't face that. Um, but actually I could see you with a spear and a loincloth and you're out in Santa Cruz, you know, yeah. Having to fight for your fight for your life against a mountain lion. But, um, but for most of us, right, that's not, those, those things aren't real anymore. So those, those primitive fears that we, that, that where we were trying to stay alive, those, those threats are not present anymore. And, but what happens is our brain now, it still fears discomfort. And so it, it's, it's an irrational fear of opportunities. It, the, the fear of being eaten by a mountain lion has been replaced by the fear of being eaten by the Silicon Valley, right? Or, or you know, the fear of, of failing to get food for your family uh, you know, meaning hunting and, and hunting is now the, the, replaced by the fear of failing to get food for your family by making money to buy groceries. Right. So these irrational fears of opportunities that would make our life great and give us what we want, uh, those are still these primitive fears in our brain that are preventing us from, you know, from moving forward. And so is it a little bit of the devil I know is better than the devil I don't know? Is that a little bit of what's going on? My, my, I think, my, yeah, I think that it absolutely is. Even it's, if I don't love them, uh, I know them. And, uh, you know, there's this Dixie Chicks song where Natalie, I forget her last name now, she sings a, a, something to the effect of, and I crave the comfort of my chains. You know, we get 
comfortable in the way that it is, even if the way that it is sucks. Is that yeah? Is that sort of where where you're going here? I, I think so. I think completely that it's it, it's you know um, we'll do more to avoid pain than we will to gain pleasure, right? And so um, when there's no immediate threat, no immediate sense of danger, no immediate pain, there's no urgency for us to change. Uh, and you know, and you see it so many times where somebody has a heart attack and then now, whoa, shit, I could die. I better change my diet. Right. Um, whereas they've been suffering at a low level of having no energy and, you know, and heartburn for years, but it was never, uh, an immense, uh, intense enough pain or, or an immediate enough pain that there was, there was no, you know, right. Nobody was chasing them with a gun. And so there was no reason that they had to get up and they had to move. And so, yeah, to your, to your point, uh, the whole devil quote, which I, I can't say without messing it up. Um, the, the devil, devil we know versus the devil we don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, I, I think that is another, another component of it is, uh, it's just, it's, we get in our comfort zone, you know, and, and all fulfillment, all great success lies outside of our comfort zone. And we have to, you know, whenever I give a speech, I usually talk about like at some point I say, you, you have to draw your line in the sand. Like you have to get clear and you have to do it in writing. You know, you, you've got to, you've got to in writing, get clear, like, like, in the book, I take, them the, on, take you on the journey of like, okay, what's your mission? Like, what is the number one goal in your life that will transform your life more than any other, even if you don't hit it, just by becoming the type of person that's willing to go for it? What is, and we call that your mission. Like, what is your mission? And so, you've got to put this in writing. You, can, you know, we can't trust our memories. I think so often that's a problem when we read books is we read a book and we get great ideas, but we don't do anything. Right. Like right. meaning we don't actually like for me, I never read a book without having my schedule there. And then I will usually, or my affirmations. And so I'll read a book and then I go, Oh, that's a great concept that I need to embed in my consciousness. I need to, I need to shift my thinking so that I, this is my way of thinking and living and being. Yep. And then I write that in the form of an affirmation. And then I read it every single day during my, you know, miracle morning every day over and 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 over again. And if I need to schedule action in alignment with that new thought, that new belief, the actions in my phone. And it's a recurring reminder, right? It's like, I can't help, but, but actually transform my way of thinking and my way of being because I, I put it in writing. I put it in my calendar and that ensures that, that these new thoughts, these new behaviors, these new ideas that I'm learning in any endeavor, they become permanent fixtures in my life. And then I see, Oh, my bank account grows. Oh, my health improves. Oh, real tangible results start to show up in, you know, in your life when you do that. Well, the, I love that. That was a very good rant right there. And so <laughs> here's the dot, right? And let me, you tell me if I'm connecting it right. So yeah. once I get clear on sort of my uh, miracle equation, if I could call it that. Yeah. Um, doesn't then um, the miracle morning uh, become a, a execution mechanism. So if I take, by way of example, um, the the working on my miracle miracle equation, which is what am I going to have this unwavering faith in or about, and then how am I going to you know I'm going to commit myself to this extraordinary effort and go for it. And now I need to embed it in my daily life. Ta da! the things I learn from the miracle equation then get executed by the way I construct my miracle morning, the this, this savers I have, et cetera. Yes? Am I, am I tracking with you, you here, handsome? You are connecting the dots. You just gave me uh, my next talking point for my next interview. Uh, yeah. No, it's actually, it's funny you say that because I have a PDF here just randomly on my computer of uh, the miracle uh, equation manuscript open. And it's funny, the page it was open to, it says, it, it's from the intro, it says a few things to remember as you read this book. Number one, the miracle morning and the miracle equation can work together. <laughs> That's literally up in front of me. Um, well, and as I'm thinking about it, you might be the first ever, if I could call you, you tell me, but like, personal development, self-help author. F fair enough. Yes. You might be the first ever to launch a prequel. <laughs> yeah. Maybe. Like I don't George, know if I, I... You're like the George Lucas of fucking self-help. You created this <laughs> literally million plus selling franchise and it's, you know, insanely popular and there's all this shit around it and Facebook communities and events in San Diego and the whole thing, right? And then you're going to show up and go, hey, want to know what it was like when Luke was a little boy? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I never thought of that. When but, uh, Obi-Wan was 30? <laughs> that's, a, that's an interesting distinction. Uh, yeah, yeah no, I mean... You might be the first ever self-help guru 
to pull off a prequel. And the, and now there's more like you just made the thing that you already created infinitely more valuable by providing people a set of tools to think about how they want to move forward in life and then use the thing that they've been doing, that is to say the miracle morning and the savers, et cetera, as the execution mechanism. It's quite interesting how your brain works, Mr. Elrod. Well, here's the, it's interesting that you say that. So here's the way that I, I can, I kind of define how these, the miracle morning and the miracle equation work together is that the miracle morning is your daily practice for personal development. And what I realized though, is that you also need a process a practice for goal achievement because you can become what I call a personal development junkie, which I'm guilty of, right? Where you read book after book and you think that by reading the books, you're actually making progress and becoming successful. But how many people are personal development junkies where they read book after book and their, their life isn't actually improving? Like they have the knowledge up in their head, but that, that doesn't t- translate into tangible results. And so that is where the miracle, the miracle morning is all about personal development, miracle equations about goal achievement. So it's like, okay, well, I'll still do my miracle morning. I'll reinforce the miracle equation. But then the miracle equation is the mindset and the practice for how you translate all that personal development into actual tangible, measurable achievement that, you know, so that your quality of life, uh, your bank account, your health, your relationships actually improve Versus just being like, I know how to improve all this shit because I read a lot of books about it, right? Like, great, but okay, now you got you to gotta take all that, synthesize all that uh, personal growth into, into actual results. A little less learning and a little more earning. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I love it. Well, Mr. Elrod, I could talk to you forever. Um, you know, brother. Anything else you want to touch on before we kick out? Um, I don't think so. I mean, uh, if anybody wants to get the book, it is, uh, this is, now, this is my first traditionally published book, right? The other 13 books I've written are all self-published. Yeah, I love this, that, that after, you know, having your own record label for all this time, you signed with one of the big, the big, who, who's the publisher? Remind me. Uh, Penguin Random House's imprint Harmony. So, yeah. That's a lot of brands in there, but I know Random House or Penguin. Yeah, yeah. Penguin Random House is the uh, the noticeable or the is the is the big brand. Yeah, big brand. and so um, yeah. Uh, dare I ask you how it's been writing with a you know big damn deal company versus a Hellrod Hell Alrod uh, LLC or whatever the fuck? You know? Yeah, it's it's been really good. It it is an interesting you know this was really kind of a a, a test where I went I'm going to try the traditional world. Um, and then, and, and either I will love it and do it again, or I will maybe not and, and just go back to self-publishing every book that I come out with because there's definitely pros and cons to each. But, um, and I really, I, up until this point, I've really liked the process. Um, there's a few things that I didn't love and I've made notes of like, Hey, if you guys offer me another book deal, these have to be in place. Um, yeah. and one of them was just, I just, I felt rushed. Like I didn't get to get feedback from like when I did Miracle Morning, I then once it was done, I sent it out to, you know, half a dozen of my close friends that are really smart. And I'm like, will you give me feedback? And then the feedback went into, I I did a ton of rewriting and the book became way better. But with a traditional publisher, they're like, yeah, that we don't, we don't do that. (laughs) You know, I'm like, all right, well, that's, that sucks because this book could be a lot better. And I, you know, and I mean, I think the book turned out great, but I definitely still go to bed at night sometimes going, Oh, I should have done that different. I should have done that. That's the other thing is you, you can't go back and change it. Once it's done, it's done. And you know, yeah, you so can cha- you can change any one of your miracle morning books whenever you want. Right. Yeah. And I've changed them plenty. I've rewritten that, you know, I've, I've done rewrites to the original book probably three times, you know, and, and reprinted it. Yeah. So, yeah. But no, I'm, I'm enjoying the process and it's amazing to have a team You know, I've got a, a publicist now and a, you know, different, just, just a whole different team of people that are working on social media and all this stuff and booking me on interviews. And so that's good. Um, yeah, overall I've, I've enjoyed the process. I'm liking it. And, uh, you know, we'll see when, when it all shakes out and this thing comes out and, uh, uh, how it does and how people like it. And, um, we'll see what I do for the next one. Well, I have no doubt it will be a monster. It will definitely be one of the biggest books of 2019 and who knows, it will more than likely become the biggest selling book in Brazil. <laughs> yeah, that, that's, that's the hope. It, it does feel like a second child. You know, if you have kids, you don't love one more than the other, or you do, but you don't say anything about it. But, um, but, uh, but, but that's how, you know, that, that means an analogy I thought of the other, you know, a few, a few weeks ago or months ago when I was writing the book is somebody asked me like, but Miracle Morning is like your baby. That's like your, your mission in life is to elevate the consciousness of humanity one morning at a time. Like, 
how is this going to fit in? And, and I was thinking about it and I go, yeah, it feels like having another kid. Like yeah. I feel just as passionate about sharing this because most people live their life with fear and with mediocre effort. And then they have a mediocre life. And if I can help the, if I can help people to replace that fear with unwavering faith and replace their la- any lazy tendencies with extraordinary effort and make that a part of their fundamental way of life, like game over, right? Game like over. people's lives are going to radically be transformed. So I hope the miracle equation, you know, makes it into the hands of, uh, you know, millions of people and, and, um, helps people to move their biggest goals from possible to probable to inevitable. I love it. I have no doubt. Dr. Appreciate you, Thanks for having me on. I really appreciate it. You come back anytime. I love you. I love uh, Berghoff. I love Roman. I love the whole crew. Brother James. Every yeah. single one of you guys. <laughs> Ruling everybody. Awesome. I love you too. We love you too, but you're, you're part, of the, part of the clan. Well, th- thanks for letting me in. I, uh, it, I, it really is an honor to be associated with all of you guys. I've learned so much and had a great time and uh, had so many great discussions and so many more to come. <laughs> awesome, brother. All right, Christopher, talk to you soon, man. Thank you, brother. Peace. Woo! Hal Elrod, I sure hope you loved that conversation as much as I did. Now, is it grow time in your business? It's got to be go time, and it's got to be grow time. And uh, my friends at NetSuite want to help you master your growth. And one of the keys to that is getting order management down nice and tight. NetSuite allows you to eliminate any bottlenecks in the way of you taking orders. And what business doesn't want to take orders? NetSuite gets rid of bottlenecks, uh, uh, errors, and gives you a smooth flow. And who doesn't want a smooth flow from the minute you deliver a sales quote to fulfilling that order, ensuring timely invoicing, and one of our favorite parts, getting paid. NetSuite's order and billing management capabilities integrate sales, finance, and fulfillment to improve the entire process and strengthen revenue recognition and, most importantly, drive the growth of your business. And as a listener to this podcast, NetSuite is offering you an awesome opportunity to spend an hour with an expert in your industry talking about your opportunities for growth. So go to netsuite.com slash different to schedule your free one-hour growth review today. That's netsuite.com slash different. And if you want to uh, get in touch with us, by all means, send email to blackhole, all one word, at lockhead.com. And uh, I'm on Twitter and Instagram at Lockhead. All right. We would like to thank the incredible Hal Elrod and his new book, The Miracle the Miracle Equation, out now wherever you get legendary books, and you can always find them at halelrod.com. The amazing people at onelifefullylive.org. This is the nonprofit helping you dream, plan, and live your best life. Check out the number one, lifefullylived.org. Now, if you're somebody who's interested in growing yourself and growing your business, there's an awesome new place for you on the internet called growwire.com. There's incredible written content, there's a uh, TV show, and there's an awesome podcast that I have been lucky enough to guest on. So check out growwire.com today. Now, are you trying to scale yourself? Do you want to take back the most important thing we have in life, which is our time? Why not check out my friends at Bottleneck Virtual Assistance? A virtual assistant can help you organize yourself, get stuff done, and most importantly, give you the power of time. Check out bottleneck.online today and the amazing people at the Front Row Foundation. Uh, I love this organization. They help people who are facing life-challenging diseases and and, and situations, and um, they give them the experience of a lifetime. So check out thefrontrowfoundation.org, and you will be able to make a gigantic difference to people who need it. All right. I will need to remind you that this podcast is a sole property of the Lockhead Oddcast Network. And uh, all rights do remain disturbed. We must warn you that this podcast is clearly produced in a studio that does contain nuts. Don't forget to practice the miracle morning and make every day count. Teach life design. And hey, don't be lame. Get out of the passing lane. Do you know that in most states in the United States, going slow in the passing lane is against the law? <laughs> Tell two people you love about two podcasts you love. Be nice to chickens. Thank you, Candy Dandy. I love you, Mom and Dad. And hey, Colin, this odd cast really ties the room together, doesn't it? Today, our deepest apologies go out to Kim Kardashian. Sorry, Kimmy. We just ran out of time for you. That's it, my friends. Thank you so much for investing part of your life with me. Stay legendary. And until next time, 
Follow your different.